This is Isaac Morehouse. Welcome to the podcast where we discuss education, entrepreneurship, big ideas, how to put them into practice in the real world, and above all, how to live free. Hello, hello, good listeners. Uh, It's been a little sporadic with podcast episodes here. I've kind of just moved into a groove where whenever something tickles my fancy, I record an episode. Today's guest tickles my fancy. (laughs) That sounded weird. The Case Against Education, great book. We're going to get into it. Just want to give you a little reminder, though, if you are sad that this podcast is sporadic now and not every week as it once was in its glory days, go check out two podcasts, Forward Tilt, 50 episodes. It's a series of five to 10 minute episodes of just little single ideas on career and life growth and progress. Check out Forward Tilt. Great podcast, if I do say so myself. And the second one, Office Hours, a show with TK Coleman and myself, where we talk through listener questions, primarily on career. But it's a lot of fun. We get into some philosophy as well. Season one is in the books, and season two will get started in June of 2018, and we cannot wait. You can also send us questions anytime. So check out the Office Hours podcast with myself and TK Coleman as well. Hope you enjoy this episode. So I will never forget the day when I was sitting in class at uh, Western Michigan University, and there were all these kids with their heads kind of down on the desk and mumbling about being hungover and completely disinterested. And there was some really easy question that was asked and nobody could, could answer it. And I remember looking around and I I had this realization. I thought, man, all I'm really buying is a piece of paper that says I'm no worse than these people. (laughs) And, (laughs) And I remember being a little bit troubled by that. And what I was, what I was starting to think about, but I didn't, I didn't, think too clearly about it until I started reading blog posts by Brian Kaplan, our guest today, was this idea, the signaling theory of education, that what you're really purchasing is more a signal than it is the learning itself, which now is like second nature to me, but this was actually a really clarifying, radical revelation for me. And Brian's writing helped so much in understanding what was going on. And and it really played a a part in leading to the inspiration for Praxis, which is the second epiphany that, well, if that's all you're buying, I think we can build a better signal. So anyway, today's guest, I'm very grateful for the work he's done because it's been really, really helpful for me to understand the education landscape and to give the initial insight that, that led to me launching Praxis. But he also is just a phenomenal interesting economist. I've had him on before to talk about immigration, to talk about selfish reasons to have more kids. I don't know if we ever touched on his book, The Myth of the Rational Voter, which is also an excellent book. And his newest book, The Case Against Education, uh, is excellent. And we're going to talk about it today. So Brian, welcome to the show. Wow, I don't think I can live up to that introduction, Isaac. <laughs> well, we'll do we'll do our best. So first, I got to ask you, how how long has this book been in the works? Because I don't know when it was, but it seems like a long time ago when I first read an econ log post of yours that talked about the signaling theory and it clicked for me. So how long have you been working on this topic? I mean, I started really working on the book in 2011. Okay. But uh, yeah, actually, you can see that I've been writing about signaling almost when I began blogging, I guess back in 2003 or so. And I've been thinking about it for a long time before that. I still remember when I was teaching labor economics and I did a section on signaling and I told the students, hey, I was thinking of writing a book on this. Would people like that? And and you know, even though the students were not jumping out of their seats, they're still like, no, yeah, this actually could be a book. So I mean it's you know, I mean, you know, like and it's the thing I might have mentioned uh, at some point. I mean, really, this is the book that I've been thinking about longest of everything I've been doing because I've been puzzled by the education system since the first day of kindergarten, really. Like, why is it that you're teaching us this stuff exactly? So much of it seems unlikely to matter in the future, and yet all the adults tell me you can't get a good job unless you jump through these hoops, so I guess I better do it. But why? Why? That was that was my feeling, too. I remember. I mean, I was homeschooled, and so I didn't think much about it until I went to college, and it always seems so odd because pretty much everybody you talk to will just laugh and admit, oh, yeah, yeah, the stuff that you're going to need to succeed in the world, you don't learn any of that in school. 
Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. That's not gonna. You know, you're gonna have to be trained on the job. It's like known. Everyone knows it, but mm-hmm. yet everyone also says. You have to go to school. You have to go to school. And I was so like mad by this. I was like, no one gives, is giving me a reason because nobody seems to know. And you have helped unlock the secret as good uh, economists do. So, so I got to ask you quickly about the title. I'm sure you've had people nitpick this before. Mm-hmm. Um, but why, why the case against education Instead of the case against school, many people will say, well, education is just learning and that's always valuable depending upon what you're learning. Uh, but school is kind of this formalized process. That's really what you're talking about. What, why the choice to go with uh, education versus school? Well, I mean, first of all, I'm the kind of person I do not like to fight people over words. If most people use a word in a certain way, I just run with it. I mean, what I have to say is controversial enough without telling them <laughs> that I'm the language police and I'm going to do it and they have to start speaking in a different way. Uh, but the other thing is that I mean, you know, a big message, a big message of the book is that uh, while there is this effort to go and push learning on people, I mean, in, in a way, you know, like you said, like, like, you know, oh, you know, as long as you're learning something useful, but then, you know, like, you know, the general idea that educate, that learning, that, you know, like anytime you learn anything, that's great. Hmm. I mean, that's, you know, you know I mean, that, that you don't even need to have that to be in school in order to have that view. And I say that's really wrong, too. I mean, you should th- be focusing on learning that's either going to be useful or inspiring rather than the idea of like all learning is good. So, I mean, like, I'm happy to actually take a stand against the blanket endorsement of learning, actually, and just say, look, you know, it's, you know it, it is not an intrinsic good. It's got to be doing at least one of these two things. It's got to at least be useful or it's got to be enjoyable or else really it is pointless. And I think there is a widespread philosophy of no, like it's always good and we should always have more of it. And so that's another thing that I'm going against is the idea that, you know, more is always better here. Just sort of all of the slogans that are associated with education, like, you know, like, you know nothing is more important than education. Like, how about food? Maybe food's more important than education. So, yeah. like, you know, so all, all of that's lurking in the background, too. I, I, love, it I love it because I think the one thing that I have found is the people who are the most productive – um, you know, and, and I mean productive, not just like they produce the most widgets in the economy, but they, mm-hmm. they get the most done move, making progress towards their own goals are often people who one of their greatest skills is knowing what to not waste time on and knowing what they uh, don't need yeah. to know. And like, I, I think there was this, I don't know if it's apocryphal, but a famous story of Henry Ford, someone was making fun of him cause he didn't know how many feet were in a mile. And he's like, mm-hmm. why would I waste my time learning that? That's of no value. I can just ask somebody who knows it. <laughs> You know, and I think that's actually a really key insight. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I mean, I, I, I like, like, I, I like that idea. And yeah, of course, you know, we, we all do it. Where someone's going into a long, rambling explanation about something, it's like, you know, I'll just, like, I don't really need to know that. Let's just fast forward to the next thing. So let me ask you about the responses to the book. I've seen a lot of coverage uh, of the book, so it's it's gotten some some great pub, um, and you've always been good at that. I, I've always admired that because I know a lot of a lot of academic work gets published in journals and it doesn't really get far beyond that. Or even if it gets published, it's, you know, published by an academic publisher, but you've done a great job of promoting your books. What has been the main response you've got? Have you gotten a lot of pushback or criticism? I mean, there's a lot of pushback and criticism in terms of what the main one is. I Meaning this is going to sound dumb, but you know, the main one is, you know, Brian's an economist and he doesn't realize that there's more to life than money. And, the real defense of education is not that it's job trading, but that it's enlightening and inspiring. And you know, to these people, I would say, look, I have a whole chapter on that. Just look at the table of contents. So don't say that I didn't talk about it. And you know, like, I mean, I'll, like honestly, I think you know, so many of the critics don't even rise to the level of noticing that they have a chapter on the table of contents. And you know, what you know, what I say in that chapter is. Look, you know, like you know, talking about enlightening and inspiring people is great, but it's not enough to get credit based upon your good intentions. You got to actually show that this occurs. You have to show that people, in fact, are enlightened or inspired, and that's where again I get empirical and just try to measure how much enlightenment, how much inspiration is education really actually supplying, and it's just so low and so disappointing that you know, I would think that people would want to challenge me on that, but not many people actually want to go and acknowledge that I, uh, the issue really. So, I mean, I think that's sort of, you know, the, the main one. Yeah, that's, uh, that's, I always feel like that's yeah. the last refuge for professional educators and just people who are, you know, fans of education in this abstract sense is like, well, it's intangible. 
The value is intangible. You can't right. criticize it. It's like above criticism because it's doing all kinds of mysterious things that I can't explain and mm-hmm. prove. <laughs> yeah, I mean, Ian, Ian, like I said, look, yeah, suppose that you, the, the, the intangible thing is inspiring love of literature, right? Fine, let's go and measure how much love of literature the schools could possibly have caused. Um, <laughs> again, that seems like a hard thing to measure, but I have a very simple approach. And I say, well, look, schools can't cause more than 100% of all appreciation of literature, right, by definition. So let's just look at total sales of all high cultural works and see where they well, like, like what they amount to. And really they amount to next to nothing. I mean, it's hardly anybody voluntarily reads literature or poetry. So, and this, and despite the fact there's an education system that does try to make them like it, but it just doesn't really happen, you know, to, a, to more than a microscopic degree. So, I mean, ultimately I don't need to deny that appreciation literature is valuable in order to make my case. And I don't know. All I say is, look, you have failed. You There's barely any appreciation of literature. You can make them read it uh, as a course assignment, but you have don't, not actually touched their souls to the point where they would voluntarily read high culture after they're out of school. Yeah. And, very and, I think, cases. and I think such a great point there is that, in fact, if you really genuinely care about kind of the, the learning, the humanist you know, goal of, of broadening your horizons and grappling with ideas – then it would actually, it seems like it'd be a better idea to separate the credential from the classroom mm-hmm. because now you've got a classroom and, in, and you know the difference. You've lectured at summer seminars where students right. come voluntarily because they're uh-huh. interested in ideas. The quality of learning is like way higher than where mm-hmm. they're there because they have to be to get the piece of paper. And so I think it's like, if, if you care about those ideas, let's separate these two things, you know, uh, and that will actually bode better for actual learning and, and diving, you know, engaging in the, the humanities and things like that. Yeah, sure. And, you know, and podcasters like you are already doing that on your own initiative. So, I mean, what's striking is that, you know, there's endless free inspiring enlightenment on the internet now. You could spend your whole life doing nothing but listening to people who are actually interesting and passionate about what, 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 they, what they're what they studying. Um, you know, of course, most people do not avail themselves of these opportunities, but, you know, as I point out in the book, what we really see here is that um, you know, the idea that, uh, you know, that, that you know, like, like there's this been a terrible problem about history because people weren't able to afford enlightenment. And then we go and we make it free and then we see, wow, people still don't want very much of it. <laughs> uh, but, you know, like, you know, that, that's that's the glass is uh, nine tenths empty, but the glass one tenth full is there's now a bunch of people that previously would have found it too inconvenient to get into enlightenment and inspiration. And now they've got it. And. Uh, we can be happy for that. And I, I do celebrate that in the book. So you know, like, like, you know, cheers to all you podcasters and podcast listeners who really do love this stuff because you know, I love it too. And I, you know, I, I hope that comes out in the book. So, uh, I guess we should have started with this, but I tend to just do things all, all randomly. Give give us the elevator pitch or nutshell version of the argument you're making in the book for those who have not read it. And we've, we've, you know, mention things, oh, that the degree is a signal or whatever, but we haven't actually laid it out. So give me the, the case against education, Cliff's Notes version from the, from the man himself. Uh, sure. So there's two totally different ways that education can increase your income in the labor market. And one of them is by teaching you skills. So you pour new job skills, so you're able to do new stuff, and then employers say, hey, you can do stuff. Great, I'll pay you more money. All right? But there's a second way, very different. This is one where you could go to school, study stuff that is completely irrelevant to any job you're going to do. But in the process of doing this, you impress employers. You get certification. You get stickers on your forehead. This person jumped through all these hoops. Therefore, he's good. And this is a second totally different reason why employers might pay you more for your education. So you think about it, it's the difference between taking a diamond and cutting it to perfection. That's like the first story where you have taken the diamond and proved it. Versus handed it to a guy with that monocle who then puts a little sticker on it saying this is a grade A diamond. Now, from the point of view of the individual, it doesn't particularly matter why exactly education raises your earnings. But from the point of view of education policy, it matters tremendously because if education is actually teaching new skills, then it enriches society in the, at, at the same time that it enriches the student. On the other hand, if the main thing you're doing is getting stickers on your forehand – or your forehead rather – it is enriching the student really at the expense of the rest of society because if everyone gets more stickers, can everyone get the good jobs? Of course not. Then everyone, you know, then you need more stickers just to be considered worthy. So basically in the story where education is giving you a lot of useful skills, it is a path to individual and national success. It's one where 
the people of the country go and learn and they become able to do more stuff and then it enriches the whole society. But on the other hand, if the main, if the reason why the education is enriching people is, this, is, uh, is the stickers, the signaling, the certification, if everyone gets more, then everybody needs more, leading to what's called credential inflation, where you need more education to get the very same job that your parents or grandparents once had. And in the book, I go over a lot of evidence on how severe credential inflation has been. We're thinking like most of the change in the modern labor market is not that the jobs that people do require more training, but that... Uh, you know, to actually do them, but that you now need more to you know, need now need more education just to be considered worthy of an interview, right? And this means that while selfishly speaking, education is about as lucrative as you think, but socially speaking, it is much worse, right? Which means that it is a uh, it is a, a, a at best a poor investment of taxpayer dollars for most purposes, and actually, in a, you know, for a lot for a wide range of cases, it is just a terrible investment. It's one where basically you are just burning resources. So one thing that I don't, I don't think you got into in the book, and, and, and as a professor, you've been teaching for a, no, a long time, so you would mm-hmm. have good evidence on this. I yep. hear a lot of educators yep. talk about this. Yeah, year what 21. About, you know, what, about, what about the case? Wow. Um, what about the claim that, well, it's not so much that the credential inflation is you know, driving everyone, you need more and more degrees. It's because the quality of education has gotten so mm-hmm. much worse that you don't actually learn basic, even the basic like reading comprehension until, <laughs> until you're done with college anymore. You know, you hear <laughs> college professors say, well, I used to get students that knew how to read when they came in. Now they don't. Is, it, could you claim the quality of education has fallen so far, you just need more years of it in order to get people to the same level. And that, and that would sort of still align with that human capital theory um, but it would just say that we, you know, that, that we need to imp- increase the quality mm-hmm. of education or something like that. Yeah, that's a great question. So I guess the main thing I would say is that at least for K through 12, I don't know of any decent data actually showing that the quality has really fallen. I mean, I think you know, like you know, the main sign, the main thing that's different is in the past the weaker students would have just dropped out, and now they're more likely to to stay, uh, to stay in school for the whole time. Uh, for college, I'd say you know, there's there's better evidence that at least. These schools that used to not exist are not as good as the as the schools that have existed for for a longer time. Uh, so you know, so there is that. So, so it's not you know, that the all, average all, student. Normally, is, normally yeah. what like when we're looking at the payoffs for education, we are going and making adjustments for uh, you know, for student test scores and things like that. Hmm. So you know, or, or you know, ideally you know, IQ scores on a on a stable on a stable metric, but. Uh, meaning, in, like, I, mean, I would say, like, like in itself, your story is one that I would want to pursue more. Just, uh, and you know, there's you know, a lot of evidence that people graduate from high school. Like, a lot of them still are barely literate or numerate. Uh, the, what what I would say is not clear is that it was ever much better. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so you know, again, like the, this, you know, like, what I say in the book is that you know the level of literacy and numeracy the typical college graduate would have is about what you would intuitively expect of a high school graduate. Uh, but as to whether this was ever much better is, uh, you know, you know, is at least not not as clear as it might as it might be. I mean, I think in the in the end, you're you're right, and that there has been a noticeable fall in standards. Uh, what we can document is that there's been a big fall in the amount of work college students do. So that has been measured more effectively. It's easier to measure time than knowledge. Hmm. Uh, so you know, we we can say that. Which is uh, interesting because I've seen a lot of data on K through twelve, especially high hmm. school. The number of hours in classroom and the number of hours of homework, those seem to be going up dramatically. Yeah. So, <laughs> I, mean, so I, I think that's true, too. I think that at least from what I've seen, the data there is not as good, but that makes sense. But college, basically, the suffering, the extra suffering that you now endure in K-12, through the system does give a lot of it back to you in college if you go <laughs> on to it. And it's like, well, gee, you know, you've, uh, you have such a miserable childhood. Now we're going to give you a four-year party. Um, so I mean that, so yeah, I mean like, like, you know, like basic number is that in the sixties, typical college student would have spent about 40 hours a week on academic pursuits and now it's down to about 27 hours. So, you know, basically like a one third fall. So this is a, this is a very large drop. Um, yeah. Yeah. I I was always really amazed. I mean, and this was 15 years ago when I was in college, but you know, I would, I would work three days a week or two, whatever I could, if I could cram all my classes into two days a week, I, I would, but sometimes it required three and I would work the other days. And then I would take like 18 to 20 credit hours a semester. And I didn't, again, I didn't go to like a good school or anything, but I didn't, it never seemed like too much. Cause you kind of just, you can get by with an A or a B doing some pretty basic stuff. 
and I was always amazed when I would run, run into people who were like taking 12 credit hours, no job, live on campus, and they would like not get their homework done somehow. And, mm-hmm. and that was when my, my initial, before I kind of came into this understanding of the signaling theory, the first in- instinct I had was, oh, I get it. College is just purely a consumption good. Mm-hmm. It's just we're rich enough to afford it. Kids want to defer growing up. And the only way to defer growing up without your parents being mad at you is to go to college. <laughs> and I think that that is actually part of the explanation for sure. It's, it's, if, mm-hmm. it were, if it weren't so expensive, it'd be easy to give that a lot more explanatory power. Right. It seems right. like an absurdly expensive consumption good. But I think the consumption good aspect plays a role. What, what are your thoughts on kind of, you know, because you talk about the human mm-hmm. capital versus the signaling. Mm-hmm. What about the sort of just... Um, Hey, this is, this is like, you know, like, like weddings, people spend a ton of money on a wedding. And from a purely economic standpoint, it doesn't seem very rational, especially since like 50% of people get divorced or whatever. It's kind of like one of those big giant consumption goods. Right. I mean, I think so. I mean, that's a story. I mean, there's definitely something to it, but I think it's really overrated because the kind of people make the art, the art, this argument are good students, people who were good students, professors. And so it's easier for them to think of this as just a great a buffet of ideas. But again, if you just take a look at students in class, most of them seem painfully bored. Um, now, again, like to me, the question but is, I, but I don't how, think they're, you know, so, I don't think know, they're consuming the, the education though. They're yeah, consuming yeah, yeah. the, so part, there, there the partying. They're, they're consuming the partying and that kind of thing. Uh, yeah. So yeah, again, like, you know, I, I believe, you know, that that is at least part of it, but here's the thought experiment that makes me think it's not that important. Namely, imagine that college provided zero financial benefit of any kind. How many people would still go? Right. Well, and I, like, well, here's, I mean, here's, again, like, like, here's I mean, a I, counter I, I, to that, though. Here's a counter pardon? to that. Here's a counter to that. OK. In you can look at the aggregate data and say, oh, okay. earnings are higher, et cetera. Uh, and that's definitely part of the part of the religion why people go. But um, yeah, I snuck in that word religion. That probably wasn't fair. But but on the individual case, when I talk to individuals choosing college and I ask them, why are you going to go? They say, well, because I have to, to get a job. And I say, well, what kind of job do you want? No idea. Uh, or, or maybe, I don't know. I think I like marketing. Have you ever looked into marketing jobs? What's required? And have you ever, oh, I'd love to work at this company. Have you ever looked at what their roles are like? They don't even say that they list a degree. They don't, they don't even bother to check. And so, and mm-hmm. so I, I almost feel like after reading Robin Hanson's book, The Elephant in the Brain, especially, mm-hmm. he talks about this concept of con- conspicuous care in healthcare, mm-hmm. where people will purchase tons of health that doesn't even make them better off because they want other people to see that they're a caring person. I feel like parents are such a dominant force in the decision mm-hmm. to go to college. And it's, it's almost like a conspicuous care thing for them. Like, I don't even care if my kid is more successful career wise. I haven't even bothered to check if it will actually help them. Mm-hmm. I just want people to know that I'm the kind of parent who puts my kid through college. <laughs> hmm. I mean, there may be a few like that, but you know, so I'm a little bit older than you, Isaac. And I can say though, if parents send their kid to college and the kid does not get a college type job, the parents are really upset. Okay. Let me, let me, is, let me the, tell the, you par- the, par- the parents do think the parents do think this is what they are purchasing. This, this is what I do for, this is what I do for a yes. living. We talk, we have talked with literally hundreds of young people and parents. And I can tell you, I, I run into this so often. It's unbelievable. Parents who are more worried about their, their child who's opting out or dropping out of college, who's got a $50,000 a year job and is absolutely crushing it somewhere. They're more worried and ashamed of them than their child who graduated with a degree and is living at home and can't get a job. I'm telling you that is so common. All right. It's it's um, it's it's a it's really this prestige thing. And parents were not mentioned in the book, but I I think mm-hmm. more than ever, kids are living at home longer, deferring decisions longer, um, and so parents are. It I would tell you probably ninety percent of the kids I talk to who are going to college and not happy about it. If their parents said you don't have to go, they would quit immediately. It's the parent, not the student mm-hmm. making the decision. Hmm. And I think it's more of a prestige thing than anything. The evidence is so strong in that from just, this is anecdotal, but it's not like a right, few, right. a few anecdotes. I'm talking yeah. about several hundred. Yeah. I mean, so, right. So, I mean, I, I, I take what you're saying very seriously, Isaac, and you know, sounds like you've got a lot of information that I don't have. So, so I will think about that. Again, well, you know, like, well, I think I think what a lot of parents would say about that situation where you have the non-college kid who's making good money and the college kid who's not, 
is that they they're just nervous that the non college kid is just get, is temporarily lucky. Yeah, they're gonna hit they're they, gonna they, hit a ceiling yeah, somewhere. Or something. Yeah, they're gonna hit a ceiling. Whereas the and, and on the other end, the kid at home, they're thinking, well, things will eventually turn around again because parents do have this strong sense that the, the entire economy is so college centric that if you are t- if you're doing well without it, that won't last, and if you're doing poorly with college. That won't last either, and that eventually the you know things will turn around for you. That's overly optimistic, but still, I mean, you know, so I mean, it's really you know people don't like people don't put the kind of due diligence into really checking about whether their exact path makes sense, and yet you know the general view that in the modern economy college is really important, uh, I'd say, is basically true. And so when people act on the heuristic, I don't think they're they're so far wrong, but uh, beyond here, but here's the other thing I would say, which is that. In my thought experiment, like how many people would still go to college if it provided zero financial gain, there's not just the people that would drop out at once, but there's also the gradual change in the stigma. So, you know, a lot of why people are going right now is because other people are doing it. Yes. But if you took away that financial gain, there'd be a big fall and people want to go just for directly. But then a lot of other people would feel like, well, since so few, since few people go, then I don't need to go. And I think there would be just a general unraveling. So, again, you know, my prediction, if in this unlikely thought experiment where college just provides zero financial gain, zero career gain, I think that the share of people going to college would fall 90% is, is my view. And so, not, not overnight, but over, over like a 10 year period. Yeah. It, I, I think it would fall over time, but I think that I think that's not quite enough of an explanation. So you could have, you have things like, t- you know, periods of time in certain areas, villages, countries, whatever, where church attendance is, so firmly believed to be this wonderful thing that makes you better off, makes you more prosperous. And not only that, the more prosperous people, because it's a pervasive belief, tend to go to church more. And then if you looked at the data, you'd say, look, more prosperous people go to church. Mm -hmm. See, you have to go to church and everyone would kind of believe this. And it wouldn't be because Mm -hmm. it was causing that prosperity. It would, it would be because this was a belief Mm -hmm. or a superstition Mm-hmm. And I think you can you can look at the college thing, and again, let's hold aside professions that legally require degrees. And I'm t- I'm telling you, I would be absolutely dumbfounded if anyone had a different result than this. If you took somebody and had them apply for ten jobs, entry level jobs, and they did it under two aliases, with mm-hmm. one they did the standard application with the resume listing a degree, with the other. They took a little, they, they made a, a one minute elevator pitch video about themselves, a little one page proposal of here's what I've learned about your company. Here's what I want to do for you. And sent them that a personal pitch deck or something, some kind of specific project towards that company. They would get at least twice the response for making something. In other words, building a better signal than a degree. And once you have something better, like it's like once you have a degree, a high school diploma doesn't matter. Once you have something better than a degree, the degree doesn't matter. So the fact that right now today this is possible, and I know it's possible because we've done it for a couple hundred people, <laughs> that you can build a better signal that employers care about more than the degree signal, you would think if it was ch- just about the economics, you'd have people leaving college in droves. But there's this really dominant belief that's, that's different from just the economic outcomes that I think is driving a lot of this. There has to be. Hmm. So I don't agree there has to be. Um, and so on the one hand, I mean, I know you've got a startup where you're trying to send alternate signals and get people good jobs without college. And I, so I wish you not just the best. I wish you fantastic success. I hope that you become, you know, the next Napster and just really bring the whole system crashing down. <laughs> well, I just, I don't want to go to yeah. jail or whatever, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but otherwise, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, but yeah. Um, but uh, you know, in, in the in the book, I do express extreme skepticism that it could really be that easy. Because again, if well, you say like you, know, if it were just a matter of doing the video, then it then I do think that a much larger numbers of people will be doing it. I think what's going on with you is you are finding special niches of the most open minded employers, and I think that most of them are not so open minded. And you know, I think that in general, there's a reason for that, which is that going and giving opportunities to people that are doing something so different. Uh, makes them nervous because like how is this person going to actually fit in with the system like this is you know like we're value we value conformity a lot so a lot of what I say in the book is employers really want conformity it may be that you have tracked down the employers who are more open-minded about it and you know like you know so like I can believe that you can find that you, your thing can work for hundreds of people but could it work for tens of thousands oh absolutely that's where that's where if my, book, if my book is right then you then you will hit a wall of course 
going and helping hundreds of people is more than I've done. So I'll have more power to you. No, I mean, it's, it's every employer, Brian, every, almost every one of the jobs that we're placing people with, and it's not just us, by the way, they say degree required. And mm-hmm. all that means is, Hey, the typical person I've met without a degree probably wouldn't be smart enough for this job, but mm-hmm. they don't like, like, I mean, even if you put a degree, even you have one on your resume, nobody ever asks to see your transcript and mm-hmm. ask you to prove it. Like you could just make that mm-hmm. up. And mm-hmm. even if it was like a filtering mechanism, but again, it's, it's once you show something more than that, no one cares anymore. I mean, it's mm-hmm. instant that the degree goes away as an important thing. Once you have one good job under your belt or one good you know, project you can demonstrate, the, the thing though, it's not that easy. And this is why it's not that easy. It is the social stigma and pressure. The kids that they know, so many kids know that they could do this, but they're like, I hate college. I don't want to do it for four years. I know I could get another job, but my parents will hate me and everyone will think I'm a weirdo. Like it's this, I'm telling you, religion is the only thing I can explain it with. It's, it's a lot of employers, but, but let me get back to your, but but, but are employers included in that? Everyone will think I'm a weirdo claim. All right. You know, if, and if that's true, then if you you have nothing else, if you're like, I just didn't go to college, there's nothing Mm -hmm. impressive about that. Or if you're like, Hey, I'm a dropout, I'm a rebel. That's not going to do anything for you. Mm -hmm. If you ignore the whole thing and say, Hey, look what I built for you. Instead of dear sir or madame, please hire me. Here are my requ- here are my you know mm-hmm. resume. If you're like I made something for you, like it takes initiative, but it's something you can do. You could spend a couple weeks or a month studying one employer, learning what matters to them, and pitching them something specific, and never mention anything about education status. And I guarantee that will get more attention every time than a, than a resume that has a degree. So it's and again, mm-hmm. if you can get more attention that way, well then the degree is irrelevant at that point. But but I, I so so here's here's why I'm very skeptical about that Isaac. So I've talked to a bunch of people at firms where they do have some non-traditional workers with non-traditional degrees, and uh, you know so, you know and like often they'll say yeah we don't care about credentials at all all we care about are, all we care about are skills and then I'll say so like what are the fraction of people that you've hired with traditional credentials versus these other other things and then usually it's like 99% of the people here have the traditional credentials and it's only one percent and then I say like how good did that one percent have to be. So, for example, for programming jobs, you know, I, you know, the top place, top firms do hire people without formal credentials who have won programming contests. But then I like, so how good do you have to be? It's like, well, you have to be like one of the five best people in the country to go do it the non-traditional route. So again, like I can believe that if you are totally stellar, you have this back door. But the idea this is realistic for a typical person, that's where I'm very skeptical. Again, I could be wrong, and maybe you're going to prove, and maybe you're going to do so well at Praxis, I will eat my words and I would be happy to eat them. What? But uh, again, like everyone I've talked to who's uh, with real world experience, who begins by saying, we don't care about credentials, scratch the surface and you basically have to be 10 times as good to go and get hired without them. So it's not a really a realistic option for more than a handful of stars. So, so, so you think that firms will, if you have a degree, they'll just hire you like that. That'll do the trick. Well, again, it's uh, it is a, a much you know they, it's not that a degree ensures a hi- ensures being hired, so, but that so, it, so but, but it, does, it, is, right? it is a much it is a much surer path to getting a job than trying to just be uh, than, than than trying to do something else. You know, this is you know I said this is why people do it because it is a you know tried and true path, which again actually does you know you're right it it actually fails for a lot of people. So, so you know, so, you know something you know, mean, yeah, my- so something something like twenty five percent of college graduates seem to be permanently stuck in non-college jobs. So, but on the other hand, 75% do end up in those college type jobs. But again, when you look at the aggregate data, this is just because ambitious people go to college. Almost uh, again, so, that. well, I mean, so, you know, chapter three in the book is all about mm-hmm. that. And what it says is, you know, even if you go and try to control for every, th- every other possible explanation for why college pays, uh, it still seems like, you know, you know like, like, it still seems like there is a big payoff. So, so, uh, when so, employer, you know, like, you know, like actually, like Isaac, if, if I were wrong about that, if you were right, then my whole book would be wrong. If it really were true that there isn't any that that uh, the reason why uh, why college appears to pay is simply that college students are better, then in fact the whole signaling model is wrong. No, and the, the, the signaling that, model. I think the signaling model is absolutely right, except the 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 addition is what employers want is a signal, and a degree is a signal. However. Employers, a, a degree is not enough to get you a job. Not having one may be enough to not get you one in certain cases, mm-hmm. but no, nobody's going to hire you just because you have a degree. The average employer looks at like a hundred or more 
applications for a single job. Almost all of them, if you're like, this job requires a degree, all those applications are going to have a degree. That's not what gets you the job. It's something Mm -hmm. more. And the insight is if I can create the something more and backfill whatever is missing when you take away the degree, because the degree is like some small part of that signal. It's a very small part because no one's like, you have a degree, I'll hire you. They need to see a lot more. So if you have the a lot more, what can you do to signal whatever it is that that degree, that kind of bundle of things, and you and you talk about conformity and some other things that it's signaling. And I think that's the insight. So I want to get back to the book. You have this, mm-hmm. this nice table where you talk about human capital, signal, and ability bias mm-hmm. effects. You've got a little mm-hmm. chart. And right. you argue that the signal works because you can't see skill. So you have to trust mm-hmm. a third-party credential. And mm-hmm. I agree 100% mm-hmm. that's what's going on, that I can't, I can't n- learn enough about you fast enough, mm-hmm. you know, to, to know if you're a good person. So I'm going to say, well, you know, this university thinks you're good enough for them. So I'll, I'll take that third party credential. However, this is where I think the world has changed so dramatically. The information cost of demonstrating all of these things about yourself from judgment to emotional intelligence, to conformity, to creativity, to all these things, the information cost has dropped so fast it, so, so if the ability to show your skill, if it wasn't so hard to see skill, if you could see skill, mm-hmm. then that credential would get less and less valuable and you could sort of be your own credential. And I think that's actually what's happened. The technological changes have made it so that third party validation is less important than ever because I can actually show you the code that I've written. I can actually show you what I've created. Would you, would you agree that if you could lower the cost of demonstrating skill, then the value of the credential would also decrease? So again, like there, there's in, in, in the hypothetical where if you could just see skill, then would credentials matter? You know, you know then right? No, they w- it would not. Uh, I do disagree that there's been much change in the actual visibility of skill. I mean, you know, so you know, like for intelligence, that's been very measurable for a long time, and so I don't see. I mean, and that's one where I, you know, I like it's you know, it's true that you could just go and give someone intelligence test. They don't have to go and do years of school if that's all you're looking for. Uh, and you know, and, con- and as I say in the book, contrary to many people, it is not really true that intelligence testing for employment is illegal. Uh, you, you know, it's actually like it's you know ninety eight percent legal or at least ninety five percent legal. But then for the other parts, so you know, like the work ethic and the and especially the conformity, these are ones where I don't see that that's, that any of that is really easier to see than, than uh, today than it was in the past. Because you know, these are things where it's easy to go and act uh, like you're hardworking in an interview. But again, like it's something where you like, you know, what it means to be hardworking is to work hard for a long period of time. We're not talking about an interview. So we have we have participants, for example, Mm -hmm. they'll do a public. I'm going to blog every day for 30 days. Now, if you've ever tried something like that, Mm -hmm. it's actually incredibly difficult and takes a lot of discipline. Mm -hmm. And it and not it's not about the writing skills so much. When someone's like, oh, this person committed to blog or to do a video book review every day on YouTube for Mm -hmm. 30 days or 60 days or you know, some sort of like in, intensive projects that require self-direction and discipline, mm-hmm. that stuff is incredibly powerful and sticks out like, wow, way more than mm-hmm. majored in marketing at generic university. Like these, these are real, these are real tangible sort of self-made credentials that have an amazing impact and ability to signal a lot of different things, not just intelligence. Yeah, so I mean, again, you know, I would like to believe that, but again, I think you do bump up against the last thing, which is just sheer conformity. And again, like you know, someone who says I didn't go to school but I blog every day, and you know, I think most employers will roll their eyes at that and say, yeah, so well, that's, that's a that, bad that's pitch. Great. Nobody's going to come yeah. with that pitch. They're not going to say I didn't go to school, I blog every day. They're going to say, hey, I want to work for you. I love what you're doing. I'm really interested in your marketing funnel. Mm-hmm. I made a video about it, and then I did this 30 day challenge where I took copy from every one of your emails and I broke apart what I liked about it. And how I would like to help you with that. And they wouldn't mention school at all. And immediately right. it's like, oh, this person is interesting. I want to interview them. Yeah. So it's, meaning it's, I, can, I, can, I can believe that if you are stellar that you might get away with that. But the idea that, that would be realistic for, for like a typical you – know, someone with the quality of a typical college student, <laughs> that's, that's where I – and well, so, I, don't, I don't know I'm, about I'm, a typical I'm just gonna, I'm just going to say you're going to have to show me, Isaac. You've I, think there's actually, a, yeah. I think there's a huge gap between stellar and a typical college student. I think there's, yeah. I, I would say ambitious, reasonably intelligent people, but ambitious and, and self-driven mm-hmm. is the key more than the intelligence. But, but, mm-hmm. I, but, I'll, but on that point, I think this actually, tell me, if, tell me if I'm wrong here. I think this actually contradicts one of the kind of conclusions you come to in the book, which is that mm-hmm. if you're a smart student, then 
you ought to go to college. And I would think that the signaling theory would tell you the opposite. Because if you're a smart student, this, this college signal is underselling you. You can build a much better signal than that. And you're kind of agreeing with that here. If you are a student who can barely pass, mm-hmm. that's college is going to be a better deal for you because it's going to upsell you. It's going to say, hey, you're as good as the average college student when maybe you aren't. And, and so like more mediocre students ought to go if, if they want to buy that signal. The ambitious, smart people are underselling themselves. They could easily in four years for 50 grand make a better signal if they've got that ability. I mean, remember, there's also grades and major. So these are the usual things that the better students do to separate themselves from the other students. Sure, if you're smart, you don't want to show that you're average for a college student. You want to show that, you're, that you nobody, are a great college nobody student. Nobody cares about GPA on a resume. If it's above mm-hmm. 3.0, it, there's no mm-hmm. difference between a 3.0 and a 3.5 to the almost any employer. I've never spoken with an employer who cares about, about that. Right. I think it's really hard well, to stand apart with the college mm-hmm. degree. Yeah, Unless so you're at, at like of Harvard course, you also stand school. apart with just the school that you're in. Yeah, the school. I mean, you know, there's, so, there's and lots, of, lots of employers care about that. I think that you're probably wrong about employers not caring about GPA. Um, so, you know, there, there is quite a bit of work on how good is the payoff for GPA. Uh, so, yeah, three versus 3.5 today. I mean, three, you know, three is so is very easy. Like, I mean, I think there's a lot of jobs where you need to be closer to like 3.8 before they're really going to take you seriously. I don't know any jobs. That's, that and then about major, degrees. right? There's hard majors and easy majors. So I mean, that, again, there, there are some large, you know, Fortune 500, more bureaucratized HR department driven jobs for sure. Mm-hmm. Um, that are looking for that or, or, you know, Goldman Sachs or whatever. But for the vast majority of jobs, you know, you go to a, a 50 person company and you want to work in the you know sales department or marketing or you want to work in, in business operations or, you know, you go to a, a tech company. GPA is is never going to enter the discussion. Yeah. So you know, like, so possibly. But again, like I said, you know, there's a long list of things that smart people do to show that they're better than other college students. So it may be that your tech companies are just going to look at what school you went to. You know, so, this, so, this, this is very standard just to say we only hire people from the top 10 or top 20 schools. Uh, again, like, you know, if you're talking about good people, like, you know, like you know, someone, someone who's really stellar, that's something. And again, majors, there's, you know, there's a lot of finance firms that say we don't hire finance majors. We only hire people with majors in physics, math, CS, and engineering. Yeah, I agree. A lot of the right. stodgy and dying industry jobs uh, care more about that. <laughs> you know, these, like, you know, these, these are like high-tech trading firms. They're not stodgy and dying. No, they're, I, I, they're, I know. I'm, they're, I'm they're, being, in a, they're, I'm in a, they're innovative I'm, and thriving. I'm being tongue-in-cheek. But, I mean, even Ernst & Young, Google, they've removed degree requirements. Like, there's there's something more, and I think this mm-hmm. this is coming quickly. A quick anecdote. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we also like like yeah. So Google, I have talked to people there, and like the removal of degree requirements is basically just marketing. And, again, there's a few people who walk on water that can be hired without credentials, but everybody else has to go and do the usual Harvard, Princeton, Yale, MIT, Caltech. You, you have to you have people. to walk on water either way. So the no, trick no, no, is, no, no, if no, I can walk no, on water without you know, you a degree, to, you know, you then why get to degree? Wait, You have to be able to wade in water to get hired with, with, with an MIT degree, but you have to walk on water to get hired just based upon your merits. Yeah, I mean, I, that has not been my experience from the employers we've we've worked with, but um, you know, I'm not saying that it can't be yes. can't be true out there. But a quick anecdote from a a reporter called me to ask about this, and I kind of gave him the spiel of you know what we do at Praxis, and that you know, look, if you figure out what employers care most about, value creation and the ability to signal that, if you can build that without a degree, blah blah. And he was super super skeptical the whole time, and then all of a sudden at the end, he tells me, yeah, my daughter went to an elite school, got great great grades, graduated. Couldn't get a job for a whole year. So finally, she went and offered to work for free and intern at a company and uh, in something totally unrelated to her major, got a free internship for six months and then leveraged that into a job. And I was like, well, she just did the Praxis model. The, the degree didn't get her no, anything. No, she didn't. But she, free... like, would she have been able to get that internship without the college degree? He said it was completely so. unrelated to her degree, I guarantee, because we give people those all the time. All the time. I, it's, Isaac, it's the... have, you read, have you read my book? Of course, pe- most people get ho- uh, hired for jobs unrelated to their degree because most degrees are unrelated to any no, job. I mean, she, but she, couldn't, she couldn't get a job, even at the firm she wanted to, until she went and did work for free, which your book mentions, mm-hmm. and this is a huge point, the, the child labor point. I think it needs to start so much younger. That's mm-hmm. the ability to do work is what lets people you know, do things like build a better credential. But going and saying, I don't know how to do this. Let me work for free is like such an amazing 
entry point that nobody uses because we have this real this distaste for it. Well, even if you're old enough to wear a child labor and, and working for free, the labor department, you, you quote them in the book, um, you know, they frown upon it. But I think that 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 sort of social stigma, people will say, you know, I, I've heard people say this like, oh, you're going to go work for free. You're being exploited. And it's like, well, wait a minute. You're sitting in a classroom, not making any money, mm-hmm. paying tens of thousands. Yeah. <laughs> you're not being exploited doing that. But I think that's really key. If, if you can say, let me lower the cost to the employer as much as possible by saying, look, I know I don't know anything, but I'm eager to learn and I'm going to make it as easy for you to give me a chance as you can. That's such a huge, I, I, that does so much more than just like generic degree. Again, if you have a degree and a bunch of other stuff on top of it, that can help. But like the ability to go and say, let me come in and work for free because I know that I don't warrant pay yet. Um, I think it's a huge missing piece in the in the career landscape. I mean, so right now, unpaid internships are a huge part of the college experience. But the important thing to remember is it's hard to get an unpaid internship. College students compete ferociously for these unpaid internships, and schools do the usual thing of saying, "All right, well, what's the you know, what school do you go to? What's your major? What are your grades?" And then they go and pick the people that have given the best conventional education signals in order to go and ration it's because out. Because you're talking about jobs. the ones that are run through the school that give school credit. That's I mean, why. Like, like, like there, there are plenty of one. No, like, it's not just that. There are plenty of unpaid internships that students do during the summer. They're not getting any academic credit. They're just getting job experience. And again, the, it's the, uh, this is this is not uh, saying I will work for free is not that great of a pitch. It's got to be I work for free and I've got a bunch of other certifications that make you want to give me. Oh, the I agree. To work for free. Saying you work for free is not a great pitch, but certifications are not a great pitch either. Uh, so you know, like, well, it depends upon what the certifications are. If it's I'm at MIT and I'll work for free, that's great. There, there's one. Well, yeah. it depends on the job. There's a part in the yeah. book where you said, you know, two people have the same SAT score because you're demonstrating it's not about, you know, raw intelligence. One has a PhD and one not doesn't. Not just raw intelligence. Yeah. Uh, one, yeah, one has a PhD and one doesn't. And, you know, they apply for a job. The PhD would get it every time. Now, I actually laughed out loud at that part because there is a negative signal to degrees, certain degrees. I, I can't think of a single employer who would ever hire a PhD for an entry level role. They would be very, very worried and turned off by that. Yeah, I was talking about a law a, a law firm, so that's different. Okay, from, okay, yeah, so, so a law firm would yeah. be different. Yeah, yeah. Right. So I mean, like JD PhD generally is more marketable, even if the PhD is not really germane. But yeah, I mean, yeah. it's true that you know for you know for entry level jobs there is there is the concern that the signal is so good that you just will leave soon or you will be insubordinate because or, you think yeah, that you're or too that good you're for it. you're just a you know you're more bookish and you're not going to be yeah. you know like you're not going to yes. go do a hundred sales calls in a day if you've got a PhD in anthropology. You yeah. Know, you're, <laughs> you're, yeah, yeah, um, no. so, so I, I completely agree with your point. And I think this is so important that MOOCs sort of massive online courses, just putting the learning part, the information part out there and more accessible and in cool new platforms is not disruptive at all because that's not the product. And I think that's a really important point for people who want to, you know, disrupt or, or mm-hmm. improve education. Um, and I don't think that gets, I don't think that gets pointed out enough that it's like, if it were just about access to information, like people would just be going to college and sitting in on classes for free. Colleges don't have to card you at the door to make sure you're paying your dues because nobody <laughs> nobody tries that. Mm-hmm. I think that's important. Yeah, a few, a few do, but it uh, doesn't seem like employers care very much. No. So I have to ask you about the, the, the advice to society at large of, look, this does not improve the welfare of society. As you said, it's, it's everybody subsidizing a couple people's, you know, improving a few people's career prospects, but it's not increasing human capital or prosperity. So you have a not, radical, not, not much, you know, not, not much. Much. Yeah, yeah. Not enough to justify. Certainly you have a radical proposal to just slash all funding to education across the board, which I love. That was my favorite part of the book. <laughs> I mean, um, the and, rad- and let the market handle. The radical proposal is separation of school and state. I think of, of just cutting fu- cutting government spending on education by by a third as the moderate proposal. Yes, but. yes, total separation, which is amazing. I love it. Um, but your advice to the individual, so you're you're taking all this aggregate data about earnings and saying, mm-hmm. well, look at the data. So therefore, you as an individual, you should go to college. Now, as an entrepreneur, I couldn't help but think. So, according to the same methodology. Uh, no one should ever start a business because it's very clear. Ninety percent. If you're looking at, it's kind of a statistical error to say ninety percent of people who start a business it fails in the first two years. 
Therefore, that's what's going to happen when you try to start a business. Mm -hmm. No one should ever start it or maybe even get married. I think it's the divorce rates like over 50%. Yeah, Don't no, you think that's kind of a bad way actually, to determine yeah. like individual yeah. choices? Well, I mean, so here, here's what I say. First of all, you should know the general success rate because a lot of people don't. Yeah. Then secondly, I'll, I, I will say, then you can go and look for signs that would be convincing to someone other than yourself that you are better or worse than average, right? Because again, you know, like everyone, like, you know, like general point, like people overestimate themselves. So you should not rely upon your own self, you know, the, your own judgment for like, I'm, I'm great. You should go and think about what, what are some, what, what are, what, what are different predictors of success that an outsider would consider, would consider convincing. And again, so the, you know, there, there are, you know, you know, there, there are, you know, there are some, you know, like, you know, you may have some concrete reason to think that you'll do better. But yeah, like, like my honest view is way too many people start businesses and most of them are, are predictable failures. And then there are some, yeah. And then on the other, there are some people that where, where they are predictable successes. So for them, the average rate is not very relevant. But again, I think, you know, most people would be better off if they just assume, if they just uh, knew the average and then figure they were average because, you know, so much what's going on is a lot, whole lot of people making the false, uh, making the false, uh, having the false view that they're better than average when they're not. So I would, I would argue that, uh, even those who fail when they start a business, they benefit tremendously more than if they hadn't done it at all. Uh, I mean, my first. What if they lose the, all, all the ones who lose their life savings? I mean, that's that's in, that's in, that's incredibly rare. Uh, I mean, that's incredibly uh, rare. Out, out of the failed businesses that I know of, I think all, virtually all of them involved the loss of life savings. And but, what happened to those people yeah. afterwards? A uh, guy who ended up working at Home Depot in his retirement because he burned through his whole retirement trying to do, uh, see, uh, run a gas station. Would he? Who, who knows? Would he have been happier? Uh, having never done it and wondering if, yeah, wondering I, think, all that I, think, time. I think you would have been a lot happier. I mean, we can argue uh, about that, but, but I think <laughs> I, I personally, I think it is a, a horrible way to live life to say, all right, l l knowing that knowing the success rates, I think is really valuable. Mm -hmm. And then saying, well, let me, instead of looking at what are my goals and what is the way, the most likely way that I am going to achieve them. Let me pull everybody. Let's pull the audience and be like, Hey, do you think that I'm likely to succeed if I do this? Right. Cause you're going to get really crappy feedback from that. So like, instead of, I mean, well, you know, I, you know, I think the main crappy thing about it is if you ask your friends, they're going to lie to you and tell you right. that you're going to succeed. Right. They're going to, but, 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 but again, like if your friends are telling you're going to fail, then I think that's a pretty good sign that you probably will fail. Maybe, um, Maybe. pretty much all the best things yeah. in life I've done have, have defied that. Um, yeah, it was so, I think that's you know, true of like, many like, people. That that's that's great for you, Isaac. And I'm really I'm really happy. But I think that's I think you, that's but, really I oh, think yeah. that's really key though. That if so, you know, take the college thing. If you say, hey, look, this is how you're going to decide whether it's worth you know uh, debt and you know whatever forty forty k in debt and four years of that you don't enjoy. Um, you know, I mean, if you do enjoy it, then it changes the equation somewhat. But Look at the aggregate data. Here's what happens. Ambitious people go to college. They make more money. Therefore, you got to go to college. Then you'll make more money. Um, I think it completely removes you from the causal relationships in your own life. Like, okay, what do you want? Well, I don't know. Well, is the best thing to try to try a few things and figure out what you want first? And then if you're like, I know I want to be an accountant. Easy solution. You got to go get a degree to get to become a CPA. So now you've got a reason you're an informed consumer or, you know what? I think I want to go into sales easy degree will not help you in sales. Uh, go get, go start selling, or I want to be an entrepreneur degree is only going to slow you down. Um, go try some stuff or, you know, like identifying, I mean, if you're an entrepreneur want, again, like what I would advise someone is to go and just get a job in the industry and then learn the industry. Well, yes, and work alongside another entrepreneur. Right. right. But, but again, well, I mean like even just to, you know, to learn the business, but in a lot of cases, then you need the degree just so you can get the job in the, in the business and learn it. Oh no. Oh no. No. If you're, if you're going to be an entrepreneur and you need a degree to get a job, you're not going to succeed as an entrepreneur. You've got to be more creative than that and innovative if you think you're going to, but I, I would just say, yeah. I, I would just say it seems a little bit to say, figure out what you want first and then mm -hmm. determine if a degree is a necessary mm -hmm. part of what you want rather than just, Hey, just go get a degree. It'll be nice to have just in case that's like, you know, everybody should buy a pickup truck because the data shows people with pickup trucks have more money. You might as well get one just in case, you know, like I, I right, feel like right. you should right. identify your goals.
Yeah, so so you know, I mean, you know, like you know, the whole point of chapter three of the book is that the connect is that you know, like the observed connection between education and income is not like the pickup truck one. It's not like the church attendance one. It's one where we can go and put in lots of different control variables and other and consider all the other explanations, and still it looks like education is causing a big increase in earnings, not nearly as big as the raw mean, but still it's it's right there. So meaning you know, like, like you know, so you know, Isaac, you are a very lovable person. You have an infectious optimism, uh, and you know that's great. Uh, at the same time, like I say, like most people who uh, think that that these things are going to work out for them are wrong. Most people are not are not special. Most people and, who think college and, is and going to get them a job again, are like, wrong. Like, it's it's you know again like if there's some, someone who really does seem special, then yeah, like your approach uh, seems like very good for them. But, I, I would you know, say the same thing of your approach, though, stupid. Brian. Like. The number of people, part of the reason I launched Praxis was because I was working with all these college students. They all had degrees and they couldn't get any jobs. So I think the number, it's very dangerous. People assume a degree is a ticket to a job. Mm-hmm. And no one's going to start sending you a check just because you have a degree. Like there is no, okay, congratulations, I got my degree. Now I'm good to go. You've got to work your butt off and do a lot of stuff. And my contention is mm-hmm. learn to do that first work your butt off and do all the other things that are necessary to get a job and then find out if the degree is also necessary. It may or may not be, but nobody knows. They're just getting the degree and hoping. I think it's very dangerous to get a degree and assume you're going to get a job and then end up like not only disappointed, but five years behind with, you know, six Mm -hmm. figures in debt or five figures in debt. I think that's very, I think that's very dangerous. I think it's, it's Mm -hmm. seen as the conservative thing to get a degree. I think it's actually a very high risk thing to do if you don't know all the other stuff you're going to need to succeed. Hmm. So, you know, I would say that, you know, it's, it's moderately risky. I mean, although even there, I would say that the, like, you know, degrees that don't pay, there's a lot of ways that you can predict whether it's going, whether it's, whether it's going to pay. So if your degree degree, is, degrees don't pay anyone, people pay people. I think that's a dangerous as to like as to whether it is statistically reasonable to think that if you get a degree that this will cause you to get a good uh, to get a good job uh, again like there are you know, basic predictors of this so like, like how selective is your school how hard is your major what you know, what are your grades like these are all these are all things that you should factor in and right, so but I, but I think again, when you look at college graduates that don't wind up with college type jobs disproportionately from low rank schools and easy majors with poor grades all right. So, so again, it's uh, you know, like, you know, for, you know, for people like that, they're the ones that I would recommend your advice to and say, look, you look, you're actually doing poorly. So probably you're going to end up in the group that is disappointed with the result. The, the key though, is that you're not, you're not people, you're a person, right? And employers mm-hmm. are not, you're not applying to a job to employers as an aggregate. You're applying mm-hmm. to one specific place, knowing what you, a person wants out of life, knowing what one employer wants I think that ought to be a precondition rather than, okay, let me, I mean, if you lived your whole life, let me look at the stats. Nope. Not going to get married. Not going to start a business. Got to go to college. Let me look at the cities where people have the lowest rates of depression and the right. Like I, I don't, I don't think that's an effective way to create an individually meaningful life. Hmm. Well, so I mean, like the the individually meaningful life is a separate and more, more interesting question. But again, in terms of, what it, what path is likely to succeed? That's one where I'd say you've got to go and look at statistics and, uh, you know, and like you know, saying like if you do something really special, then you can get a special result. Uh, that may be true, although also worth pointing out, most people think they're special aren't. But by definition, whatever works for me is special, because <laughs> because no right, there's no such thing as the average man, right? Like what works for me will not be the best path for any other single human being, period. I mean, I mean you could say that uh, when you're gambling in Las Vegas, but <laughs> but you shouldn't. You say, look, but I that's, maybe that's I'm completely the different because that's not, that's not a, great. but that's not a causal situation, right? It's not, it's, it's not at all. It's far more complex than that. And you're actually, you're not creating value and getting remunerated for that value when you gamble. It's, it's, that is a statistical game. I mean, if you're playing, Mm -hmm. if you're playing, you know, something more like five card draw, there's a reason there are professional gamblers Mm -hmm. and there aren't because that actually does involve skill, but, but a much higher degree of, you know, randomness and, and probability. But I think your success at, let's say winning a girl's heart, if you want to date somebody, would you say, look at all the data guys with short haircuts, get more dates. I'm cutting my hair. Or would you say, I'm not trying to date 
the average of women in general. I'm trying to date one woman. I need to figure out what she cares about and focus relentlessly on that. And I think employers are no different. Hmm. So I think the last thing that you talked about is called one-itis, and it's generally recommended against. <laughs> well, I mean, like at any given time, right? So you treat you treat yeah. 10 different employers like that, or women, right? But if you're like, hey, hey, woman, I did these things that women in general find desirable. Here's my list of 10 attributes, right? Even if the statistics show you your likelihood of success is higher, the mindset of let me do what appeals to the average of women or employers is actually a, a dangerous mindset in assuming that's going to get you something versus let me think about my unique characteristics and let me think about the type of women or employers that I'm interested in and what can I do to impress them and start from there. And if it requires a degree or a haircut, uh, great. But start from the, from the individual cases rather than I want to do the things that will make me appeal to the broadest number of people based on statistics. I think that's kind of a false sense of security that you'll gain from that. Hmm. I mean, I would say you definitely want to do both, right? <laughs> uh, so yes, it's it's helpful to go and get, get get additional information about the specific case, but you also want to have a lot of traits that on average work, right? So you know, like, like you, if you've ever had a friend who had a lot of trouble going and find, finding a girlfriend, uh, you may like you know one piece of advice is well, you want to find you, you don't want you want to go and find women that would like guys like you. And then you say, all right, so hmm, that's not that many, actually. And then you say, hmm, we need to go and expand the pool by going and changing a bunch of things about you. You don't sure, dress but, well. But in terms, of what, really in terms of what yeah. you want to change, I mean, there are always general things. But I think thinking about what, are the, what type of woman are you interested in and then kind of working mm-hmm. from there instead of just like womankind, you know, prefers this, that, or, <laughs> or the other thing, because the, you almost have the problem of being, you know, the opposite of, of desirable at that point. But anyway, okay. Right, right, right. So, on. So one, one other thing, Isaac. So the other thing is like, you know, so people like you and me, we are unusual in that we have these extreme enthusiasms for different eccentric things. But, you know, something to understand about most people is a lot of people don't feel much enthusiasm for anything. And you might say it's because they, they haven't really lived life in the right way. But I think a lot of people are just built this way that like, you know, they look like, like, like they aren't all that particular. Look, I just want to get a job that makes me go, you know, some good money. I just want to meet someone, you know, meet, meet someone, you know, marry someone who seems pretty good. And I think there's a lot of people out there who are basically like this. And for them, the simple approach of just, you know, just check all the boxes and then see what happens works out for a lot of people like that. And, I mean, you know, it's easy for, for people like you and me to go and say, no, you're doing it all wrong. You should be living life to the fullest and, you know, carpe diem. But I mean, for a lot of people, this just like doesn't make any sense to them. They're just not – they're just so conformist and, and so normal that I, I, I this agree is with not you what there. they want to do. I, I never try to proselytize to uh, <laughs> those who are not interested in living. It's those who are that I – but so we can agree. If you well, are I mean, not, it's all it's all living, but you know, there's like more boring than yeah, yeah. Living. No, if, and, we can you know, totally like, agree. Yeah. If you are totally <laughs> unenthusiastic about life, you should go to college, right, Brian? Yeah, really. And there, there's people like they're, enthousi- <laughs> they're enthusiastic about like race cars and sports, but they're not good enough to do either of those. And you know, they they want to have like a decent middle class income, and you know, like there's like and and again, I say there's a lot more of them than there are of us. So this is like the system, I, I, like you know, in a way is where it, like is working for them. I still think it's say, dangerous like, though to yeah, to yeah. assume that that going into debt is going to pay you back. I think you ought to look a little more a little more closely and, and be careful yeah, on that. You know, so, I mean, so like like in the book, of course, I put I do, I crunch a lot of numbers to find under what conditions is it reasonable to think that that will work, and when will when is it not reasonable to think it will work? You even put. Uh, a Price on yeah, boredom yeah. in class, I believe. Which yeah, yeah, a, yeah. Which, so, yeah. Which was a Herculean, yeah. uh, heroic uh, thing to attempt. <laughs> <laughs> so, Brian, uh, we've had I, I've been throwing all kinds of anecdotes and disagreements at you, but I got to say, overall, I think this is a great book. I think it's worth reading. I think establishing that the signaling theory is the the bulk of the explanatory power of what's going on. And importantly, that it's a very complex signal. It's actually hard to tease out what entirely Mm -hmm. it's signaling, but it's more than intelligence. It's a lot of things at once. Very, very important. And I think, uh, you know, the, the thrust of the book in general, um, is phenomenal. I'm probably the only interviewer who's going to say to you, I don't think your case against education is nearly strong enough, but I, <laughs> but I like where you're going and I hope you, uh, you keep it up. What's, what's next for you? What are you working on next after this, uh, this ah. you know, publicity tour? 
All right, so I have almost finished uh, my nonfiction graphic novel on the ethics and science of immigration. Ooh, oh my gosh. I can't wait. All right, that is, so... That is a topic where we agree 100%, so I'm yes. super excited. <laughs> right, right. So, I mean, and this is something where I, you know, I, I'm like, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a very Isaac project because, you know, I'm a professor, I write journal articles, I write books, uh, but I love graphic novels. And I said, you know what? I want to do a graphic novel, even though I've never done it and I'm in my 40s and I can't draw and I still want to do it. And it. and I've done it actually, so it's it's basically done, and we're getting published. So I'm really really excited about that. My you know my artist is, uh the, you know is the guy who draws Saturday morning breakfast cereal. I don't know if you know the. Oh yeah, the, absolutely. Yeah, so Zach Wiener Smith is my artist, and it's the most fruitful co collaboration of my life. And actually, I completely you know he didn't even know me when I started the project. Really, he'd read some of my stuff, but I talked him into being my collaborator, and he's drawn like 175 pages for me now. Wow. Um, so yeah, and like like every everything is going according to schedule on that. Uh, so yeah, I mean, and the, you know, and, you know that this this is a project that means more to me than you know, maybe anything else that I've done. It's just you know, like you know, it's the topic I'm passionate about, but it's just so, you know such a wonderful creative process and such a great collaborative process. You know, I'm I'm just thrilled that I've I've had this opportunity to do it. I'm you know a huge fan of graphic novels, so to get to to get to be one of the creators, uh, you know, mean, means the world to me. That is, that's just absolutely amazing. I mean, I love, I love that you are putting this in narrative mm -hmm. form, graphic novel. That's just absolutely awesome. I love it because yeah, that's one of those issues. So expected in September, 2019. That's amazing. And immigration is an issue where I think the, the data and the studies are great, but that's, that's not fundamentally how mm -hmm. people are thinking about it. And so mm -hmm. appealing on the level of narrative. Mm -hmm. uh, Good for you, man. Right, right. Well, so, Brian, it is, so, it is, so it is non it is nonfiction. So it's not on it's you know it's not a story in a conventional sense, but it's a graphic explanation. You know, it's basically you combining words and pictures to make the uh, to make the case. Uh, so the book is going to be called "All Roads Lead to Open Borders." I love it. I love it. Cannot wait, Brian Kaplan. Pick up The Case Against Education on Amazon. Great book, worth reading. Yep. Dive into it. You can decide if uh, my. You can decide if my disagreements with Brian are, hold any weight or not. Thank you so much for coming back on the show, Brian. Keep up the good work. Yeah, my pleasure. So it's only twenty bucks, and yeah, and by the way, so unless you know, it, it was not clear. So I mean, I, I th I'm a huge supporter of Praxis. I think it's great that what you're that you what you're that what you're doing is happening. I don't think you're going to bring the college system crashing down, but you know, like like what I've told many people is. Like you know, like if you're running a business, it just needs to. If you can go and uh, and run a successful business that helps a bunch you know, like, like hundreds or thousands of people, the fact that millions keep doing it the conventional way doesn't really matter that much because you know, like you have made a, a dent in a problem and you've delivered value. So good for you. Well, I I'm not at all concerned about whether or not college comes crashing down. I sort of see uh, college formal education is like riding a train, and careers are out in space. We don't mm -hmm. care if you ride a train or not. We're trying to launch you into orbit. So we're, we're going to keep going and we'll see if we can hit the uh, tens of thousands that we've aimed for. But uh, in the meantime, much appreciated. Thanks for the, the kind words and thanks for the great work. All right. Thanks a lot. It was great. Great talk, Isaac. See ya. Bye.